Come, sit in conversation with me as we meet several amazing people. On behalf of the Mental Health Board of the United Church of Christ, I had the honor to be able to interview some inspiring folks who with their beautifully diverse bodies, mental health experiences, and unique life stories, represent intersectionalities and life perspectives all their own. In the video series we have created, we go deep into the diversity of human experience and we will find that our assumptions are challenged and our prejudices called out. But most of all, we will discover the connection, the sameness, the beauty of what we share with people who have different life experiences to our own. In this first video, Reverend Rena Ramos, Reverend James Triplett, Reverend Dr. JJ Flagg, and Reverend David Hosey will speak to us about God, about their mental health struggle and pain, about the challenge of people who just don't get it, and their unique intersections of lived experiences. Together, these elements become the creative driving force behind their ability to connect deeply with themselves, with God, and with others. Trauma shakes us to the core and upends our reality. Honestly, it, it isolates us from everything we know, inner and outer. And there are many sources of trauma. One that many of us cannot fathom is the upheaval of our homeland at the level of personal deadly violence and the necessity of leaving everything behind to come to a country, as our first speaker puts it, that doesn't want us. Well, this is the experience of Rena. She's a lawyer, a pastor, a lesbian, a disability rights advocate, and one who immigrated from El Salvador to these United States of America. I'm going to, to, to ask you a question and please let me know um, if in any way I have this wrong. So you talked about uh, being in El Salvador. Uh, were you born in El Salvador? Yes, I was okay. born in El Salvador okay. uh, in a little town countryside where my mother, who's a nurse in El Salvador, was doing her residency. So it happened that I born in the hospital where she was working and the attending nurses were her friends. And so one of my godmothers is one of her dear friends. And I'm named after the doctor who, um, uh, you know, saw me into life. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, all that people were family to my mother. So, I, I, you know, that's where I was born. And then my mother moved, moved us from the countryside to the city. And then all my growing up until age 14 was in San Salvador City, which is the capital of El Salvador. So I am a city girl <laughs> and, and I like urban life a lot. And uh, in my growing up, one of the things that mark uh, my growing up was the, that the war in El Salvador, the civil war started in 1980. And so as kids, we learn how to live in the war times mm -hmm. by trying to protect one another and also learning how to survive the shootings, the bombings, the disappearances, the this and the other, and, and just learning how to navigate those times of um, fear and, and repression because the government was repressing the people of El Salvador. And so, for instance, when Monsignor Romero got killed, he was presiding mass when he got killed by a sniper a one bullet to his heart after he had given a homily to try to stop the army from continuing repressing the people. That night, a neighbor came to knock at our door and secretly told my mom, Monsignor has been killed. And I, I saw my mother's face drop. And then we started all just very quietly learning what had happened, but we couldn't mourn the killing of this amazing person who was standing for the poor 
because we could have been labeled as communists. So we had it to mourn him in silence. And so that's how you learn sometimes that you don't know who's watching. Your neighbor could be a person who works for the government and could tell on you. So we needed it to be quiet in the way we mourn Monsignor Romero. And I just remember it to be a very somber night. I just remember it to be a night where things were very quiet all around us and within our household. So that's, you know. As Rena came to mourn in silence, she also learned to hide vital parts of herself in order to be presentable to whatever group of people she needed to work with at the time in order to survive. Hiding as a lesbian or promoting her educational credentials to be legitimate was in her words, exhausting. Now, while she openly embraces her identities and intersections, she sees those who cannot as the ones who must change. And she talks about the toll it takes on her life. I am somebody who is ridden by anxiety. Mm. And I recognize that today as part of who I am. You talk about interse intersectionality, that runs the show. My anxiety runs the show, you know? Yes. Uh, and it, it makes me very productive, but people don't know the nightmare that's going on in my head, like do, 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 you know, uh, or, or something of the world is going to collapse. Yeah. So I live with anxiety and I have lived with anxiety because I, I think it might be one of the effects of the war, of the crossing the border, of being discriminated against. Who knows? Uh, but I, I, you know, I used to buy my nails, you know, but I now I don't do it. So that, that's good. But um, I, I know that I needed it to deal with that. And so I, you know, I have done therapy. I done um, some uh, courses on anxiety to learn how to cope with it. And just lately, um, I think it was four years ago when I finally decided I was going to take medication for it. I still have to do a lot of, for instance, go for walks when I feel my body is ready to jump like I, I feel it in my body I need to go and do some kind of a physical activity uh, meditation helps so of course I mean I, I think we don't go through life without having the wounds right they yeah, right. they mark us right and and I'm I have been lucky to have the access to mental health and to have the access to therapy and the access to uh, health insurance that covers for things and the help that I needed and people around me, a good network of uh, supporters and colleagues and friends that has helped me. Uh... To take us into another very different living with wounds experience, I'm gonna introduce you to James J.M. Triplett. He describes himself as a Black, queer, progressive, Pentecostal preacher, and one who, tragically, suffered abuse as a child through several families. In fact, he was adopted twice. During that formative period, his only constant was God. Here's the emotional landscape where he lives now as an adult. So how, are there any tan any sort of um, maybe like uh, mental health terms, right? That you can give us for how that has manifested? Uh, has it caused a bit of anxiety? You know, has there been depression, suicidal ideation, any of those things? What does that look like? Yes, uh, excellent question about that. Um, medical terminology for what I'm dealing with is PTSD. Uh, depression, um, high anxiety. Um, I deal very strongly, you know, syndromes that a lot of people are familiar with, like the imposter syndrome. Um, I deal with a syndrome that is a, a, an attachment syndrome because of the adoption and the, the early childhood development. I have a, um, a, 
um, a problem with attachment. So either I attach very strongly or I don't ta attach at all because of how attachment uh, is formed in my mind. So all of these uh, diagnoses, I am, I am medicated. I am one who is on medication. Um, I was raised not to believe in it. I was raised not to believe in mental health and also not to believe in medication because God can heal. And if God doesn't heal, you don't, that means you don't have enough faith. You don't believe that God can heal. But that's not truth for me now. Truth for me now is that God is healing. And, and as God is healing, I am also doing my part to help co-facilitate the healing in which I now know I need. Where is God in the, in the midst of that PTSD? In the midst of that imposter syndrome, in the midst of the depression, where is God? Right with me. The whisper that if I pause long enough to pay attention, it's even better. I'll go on musical terms. Sometimes there is a note, a sustained note, that it could be a place of silence and you hear this one singular note. That doesn't change. It just keeps going. It is our job to pick, to, to put attention to that note in order to hear what it's really doing. God is that for me. That God is speaking. You're fine. You're okay. You're, you're ahead. You're not the tail. You're more than a conqueror. You well able. You know and you believe. And in my unconscious state, I'm like, oh, I can't do this. No, I'm triggered. Um, I'm in fight, flight, or freeze response. I'm, I'm navigating things out of, um, out of my trauma. I'm trauma with trauma, um, response. I'm navigating what people are saying based upon what I heard them say based upon the trauma that I came from. And if I pause for a moment, I can hear God say, take a breath. You're okay. And that's the discipline. It's the, it's the wait patiently on the Lord <laughs> to take the pause. Um, and, and, and so for me, it's God was and is with me in the places. It's like air. God is there. And that if and when I tapped in, was the exact moment I needed to. And it gives me the exactly what I need to bring myself exactly to the place that I can get exactly what I need. It's all things work together for good. And that's what keeps me going, even in the places I don't, even in places where I'm triggered. And I'm saying, oh God, I, I call out to God in my places of being triggered. I sing. When I'm scared, I sing when I'm anxious, I go and pray. And what answers me in, <laughs> in those moments is what I need to sustain. So that's where God is. When I call on the Lord, <laughs> he comes. I want you to meet Reverend Dr. JJ Flagg, who will take us on a deeper dive into the encounter the connection that we find with ourselves and with others as we seek God in this broken world. Reverend Dr. JJ self-identifies as a Black disabled male who lives with a physical disability. Um, so the question about uh, how I am the Imago Day, that's, that's a really funny question because um, this question is central to my theology. Right. Um, uh, and I, I, I love sharing with people. It was the it was the Jewish philosopher Emmanuel Levinas that said, if you want to see what the face of God looks like, uh, look into the face of the other. Uh, if we want to talk about what it what it means to be the Imago Dei. Uh, for me, that means blowing up. Uh, the, the the conventions around God fitting within a particular box, right? So uh, for some people, 
God is an old white man with a long beard sitting in heaven wanting to beat you over the head with a cane when you mess up, right? And a perm. Don't forget. <laughs> <And a perm. laughs> For some of us, God is, you know, somebody with a jerry curl and a, and a big gold tooth and, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, so many of those other things. For me, um, I have, I have really, really sat down and toyed with the idea, what would it look like for me to make it to heaven and God be a direct reflection of who I am? Mm -hmm. So when people talk about, you know, you're going to get to heaven and one day you're going to be able to walk around. And, but, but what if I get there and God's rolling around? What if I get there and God has long locks and, and brown skin? Uh, um, and have we, have we, have we, have we opened up the space enough to be, to believe that God could look very different than what what I have settled on God looking like? And I think part of why I wrestled with my own place in the church for so long was because I could not see a God. I, my mind was not open to the idea that there could be a God that looked like me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so now. What does that look like for me engaging the world? What does it look like for me to, to to realize that for some people I'm the closest to God they will ever get? Um, so what is what does it mean for me to live an authentic life so that they can feel free to live authentically? Um, if I'm constantly trying to be somebody else, then I'm not creating free people as a spiritual leader. I'm only this is this is perpetuating bondage. The same bondage that I'm saying the church calls on me. So uh, that that thought of Imago Day has there 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 are many uh, there are many uh, consequences to if we don't if we don't preach it uh, and if we do and we do it well then we create uh, a community and an opportunity for authenticity. So you said that you identify as Christian. So my first question is Much for you. Much to my own chagrin sometimes. Right. Well, look, if I could put it in a Facebook category, it would be, it's complicated. Okay? <laughs> like Christianity is complicated. Um, how has your being a Christian, especially in light of having so many Christians, I mean, one of the, one of the things that is so fundamentally frustrating is that a Christian is not a Christian is not a Christian. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So you can't you can't weave everyone together um, and say because dear God, please don't have me standing next to Jerry Farwell. <clears throat> so <laughs> I, you know you have to ask the question, right? As as your type of Christian, as the Christian that you assign and ascribe yourself to be, how has that impacted and affected the way that you interact with those who don't choose Christianity? Yeah. Um, so, so I think it's important, and, and we, you've already done this well, uh, in, in a much better way than I would have, um, um, name that there's far more than one Christianity. And I had a, 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 a professor in seminary that asked the question, um, ultimately when you leave this place, the question will be what, what Christianity you will leave with. Mm. Uh, and for me, that is a Christianity that is rooted first and foremost in um, God's struggle and God's people's struggle for justice. Um, I think when you look at when you look at Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, right? It is a story of people fighting against the empire in pursuit of justice, um, and nobody can tell me anything otherwise. I think that that is the over art, art, arching idea of scripture it is oppressed people trying to find a way to be heard and to be understood and to relate to their creator in a way that is personal um and so for me what does that look like when i'm engaging with people who are not christian it is to create space to say you know what we may not encounter god or the way that we conceptualize god in the same way but that does not mean that i can't learn from you and you can't learn from me uh and so um, I catch a lot of flack for this, but in my own ministry space, one of the ways that I believe that that takes shape 
when I close any of my prayers, I close it in, in your holy names, we pray. One of the reasons why I use that close in a prayer is because God does not have one name. There may, some will call God Buddha. Some will call God Krishna. Uh, for for those who practice Islam, in Arabic, it is Allah, which also boggles my mind that people have an issue with that because in Arabic, it is literally God. Literally. Mm -hmm. so, so by praying... In your holy names, I am acknowledging that there is room for all, all of us at the table. I believe all of us, neither of us have it all. We all have a peace so that we might all have it all at some point. Um, but the question is, are we creating an opportunity for people to come to the table and glean from one another rather than trying to say my way is the only way or the best way? So uh, for me, that type of my type of Christianity makes space for people to believe in a God that 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 is central to their experience and and makes room for them to be uh, connected to the creator in a way that is meaningful for them. Based on everything that <laughs> that, that has um, that has built you up. Right. So even the things that tear us down can serve mm -hmm. as foundations to build us up based on everything that has built you up to the person who is suffering from mental health challenges to the person who 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 has a disability. Right. Um, and one of our other interviewees challenged that, you know, why why do we have the term able at all disabled, differently able? Right. Because that doesn't mean I'm not capable. It yeah. doesn't mean I'm yeah. not able. Right. Yeah. Based on all of that, to someone who is 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 living in the intersectionality of so many different things in our society, why, why God, why not turn my back on the whole thing, right? Because if if God is the face of the other and the other has treated me like this, yeah, why? Yeah, I. So why God? Um, <laughs> I man, listen. I wrestled with that question. Um, I wrestle with that question every day. Uh, why God? Um, but then the question always comes back: Why not God? Uh, what? Where else? Where else? Where else do I go? Um, what other? What other places there in the world that takes the good and the bad and makes sense out of it? Um, not to say that those things are, if I if I could change it all, right, I would. But since I can't, what will I do with it? And God gives me the place where I can say, I don't know. You, you have to know more than I know. There has to be some reason that's bigger than me, uh, some place that's bigger than me, um, some reason that's bigger than something. Uh, and so for me, that's why that's why I have no choice but to go to God, because mm -hmm. if I don't, um, then I'll be left to my own devices, mm -hmm. uh, and my own devices won't won't lead me uh, to a to a to a healthy place. Um, <laughs> not with the, not with some of the things that pop in my mind when I when I encounter <laughs> some of the stupidity that I've encountered. I mean, so right. so right. It, so so God for me is that that. Um, James Cone, uh, and I believe he got this from, um, you know, the mothers of the church uh, that would say um, that God props us up on every weak and leaning side, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and if you spent any time in a black church, you've heard that uh, heard that phrase uttered somewhere uh, in the church that God, we want you to prop us up on every weak and leaning side. And so those moments where I'm weak and I'm leaning. It is God who has held me up. It is God that's held my tongue. Um, it is God that's kept my fist from flying uh, in a way that's not meaningful or or productive. Um, Wait, you mean there is a meaningful and productive way to fly fist? Absolutely. I, that's, I, oh, I can't wait. Oh, I can't wait. This is a whole follow-up conversation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you look at the black power fist, right? Uh, oh, you mean? Yeah, you got it right behind you. Uh, uh, I think that that is it, that is a sign and a symbol of revolution. 
Uh, and so rather than rather than me knocking you out, um, I, I'd rather I'd rather put it up to say that I am in solidarity uh, with 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 those who are who are seeking a better world. Um, uh, yeah. I, so God is the God is the being that gives me that kind of a framework to to believe that there is there has to be a better world beyond what we're living in right now. Um, and if it weren't for God, I don't know what else there would be. So if there's room at the table for all, then it follows that God is in the very heart of our suffering. God is manifest in the mutuality of our human condition. This is the sacred connection God has with us. David Finnegan Hosey, pastor, cisgender, diagnosed with bipolar, talks about the grit of Jesus on the cross and his experience of forsakenness. For me, I come back to, there are these foundational images in our faith and in our scripture that I just come back to again and again, and I can't, I can't get away from them. And one of them is Jesus on the cross saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the faith that claims that moment as somehow central to our proclamation about God. That to me, I can't let it go. I don't know uh, how else to say it. Um, that, that the God we see in Jesus is a God who is present in the moment of what is experienced as God forsakenness. I can't look away from that. And when I don't look away from that, if I stay still for long enough, I get to witness resurrection. And it isn't always easy. And for sure it still has scars. But I still have scars, and I always will. And so I need a God with scars. You know, it comes back to the church. Those of us who have witnessed Christ in the muck with us, experiencing all the empty forsaken places, the pain, the hopelessness, that gives us the vision to be the divinity that ultimately saves us. JM talks about the hope that we have in each other, the face that we are of God to one another. Let me say, let me say as our as our as as, as we close, what would you be able to envision the world looking like if we were able to all stand in our I amness and then also respect namaste right recognize the I amness in the other what would that what would that look like what would, what would it take to get there oh it it takes it takes something simple it takes surrender it it takes it, it takes us both embracing and letting go of our godness because we are perpetuating our godness in the wrong fashion. We're still gods though. The scripture says those who are led by the spirit, they are the children of God. We are made out of the same essence as the eternal. So it would be easy for us to come together if we surrender. 
The problem is how we view God is, and we're pushing to be this type because we think this is the most prudent way. And it is actually taking us away from our God, our God nature. It's going to be easy yet impossible because human nature does not surrender easy. We do not relinquish control easy. I struggle every day. This is the struggle of Christianity is every day you let go. Jesus said, as the flowers bloom in the field with no worry about what to eat, they are arraigned with all the glory of Solomon. They don't think about doing anything, which is why they, except you come as a child, you should not inherit the kingdom. Children just believe. Which they can, if you want to know how the world can be, go sit with permission at a primary school and watch kids. I love that. Consent. Right. Mm -hmm. Watch kids play. Trouble happens. Pain happens. Disagreement happens. But when you get kids in the same room, I'm getting emotional because I can see it. You see a baby that's in the corner by themselves and you see someone go to them and say, hi, who are you? Do you want to play with us? I don't need to know what ethnicity you, I don't need to know who you like, who you attracted to. I don't need to know what kind of toys you play with. I don't know if you like Barbies or, 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 or cars. Do you want to play with us? Why would God not want us to be this kaleidoscope of beauty that is a representation of who God is. All of us are created in the image and likeness of God. Our nuances, our limp, our tweaking eye, our longer earlobe, the imperfections that we are and that we love is God. It is the it is the I am. We connect together with the I am. And this power that is available to us, if we can surrender, can heal the world. There is something that you have that I don't have and that I would never have because it's in you. And my job is to come find you and ask you, how can we work together? We can do this. That's me. It is our hope that the beauty, power, and vulnerability revealed throughout this has touched you and challenged you. Now, it's up for all of us to take up God's mandate to enter the injustice, enter the ignorance, and to go against the walls that surround intersectionality for so many individuals in all of our midst. Let us enter now into conversation that focuses on expanding inclusivity and awareness. We really have to hold each other accountable for the practical steps that we each pledge to take. We at the Mental Health Network would be honored to hear of the response that you have to this video series. Blessings as you encounter intersections in yourself and others, and even experience them as your path to the divine. Amen. <laughs>